Welcome everyone. I'm Katie Capuzzo, Director of Community at WISE, and together we're a global community dedicated to empowering the next generation of women leaders. Huge thanks to our partners for making events like this possible, and special thanks to AlphaSense and GitLab for lending us the panelists on screen with me today. It is hard to believe that we're already at the end of the year, and with that can bring new opportunities, intentional reflections, and performance evaluations. So today we're going to be discussing how all of those can influence potential performance conversations, whether that means an immediate promotion or something long-term career path-wise. Joining me in this conversation is Allie Marconi, Vice President of Self-Service and Online Sales at GitLab and Carolyn Manuel, Senior Director of Corporate Sales at AlphaSense. So Allie, I'll hand it over to you first to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Great, thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Allie Marconi and I apologize, I am sick today, so I'm a little bit, might be a little bit more challenging, but I definitely didn't want to miss this event. I was looking forward to it. Um, so I work at GitLab, um, I'm in the Oakland area. I lead our self-service and online sales. I also lead our global SMB business, and I'm also responsible for a lot of our net new lands on the lower end. So I own a lot of like the, I would say at scale product, go to market um, type motions for the company. Um, I've been at GitLab for about four years. Prior to that, I was at Salesforce. Uh, I have a history in business and engineering, that's what I studied. And you kind of see that work in a lot of what I've ended up doing professionally. Um, and a little more personal about me, I have a three-year-old daughter and a one-year-old daughter who are both sick as well. And I have a uh, fun fact, I have a 130 pound dog named Primo, who is a what Burmese type of dog? dog. <laughs> he's a Burmese mountain dog and he's like, I swear, the biggest one we've ever seen. Like we run into other ones and I'm like, are they, <laughs> is this seriously the same? The same breed, but he's a uh, he's a cutie pie. Ah, oh, what's his name? Um, Primo Angelo oh, Marconi. <laughs> Love that's, the full name. That's an amazing dog name. That's awesome. <laughs> yes, that's hilarious. Carolyn, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Katie. Um, I'm Carolyn Manuel. I am a senior director of life science at AlphaSense. Um, I lead a team of 11 individual contributors, and um, the team has grown as the organization has grown, of course. I've been there about five and a half years, and um, prior to that, I was with Standard & Poor's for roughly 15 years um, in both the sales capacity as well as a management capacity uh, through different roles there. Um, I actually began my career um, in it, banking um, and sort of was managing real estate investment trust funds. I was an energy analyst for a number of years. And um, we'll get into this a little bit later in the program. But um, really what led to my career in sales was a shift utilizing a product, which was kind of an interesting path. But um, AlphaSense has been a wildly growing um, organization and continuing on that growth path in 2025. So looking forward to chatting a little bit more about career progression promotions um, as we continue to grow as well. So this topic is really timely um, for me personally today. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Panelists, thank you, whether you're sick, post holidays in general, I know this is a busy time of year. So really excited for this conversation and for those that were able to join today. Throughout the conversation, if you have a question, there's a little question mark box on the right side of your screen, drop it in there or in the chat and we'll get to it at the end during the Q&A portion. So let's get into it. This first question is for both of you and Allie, we'll start with you. How important is timing when bringing up the topic of a promotion with your manager? Um, so I even, um, I have a bit of a different philosophy that I've used in my professional career in terms of bringing up a promotion. So I do not have a military background at all, but I heard this saying from the Navy and it like always stuck with me. And it's basically ship first, then shipmates, then self. And I feel like I try to take that into the corporate world. So oftentimes for me, I... I don't think I've like really ever brought up a promotion specifically. What I think I bring up more is like business needs and business opportunities. So when you're talking about like an opportunity, even, you know, on the back inside your head, if you're like, I want a promotion, my recommendation is to like come to your manager and say like, Hey, 
I think we really need, you know, to continue to invest in this area. I think this is critical for the company. I believe that like, if we do this, this is the impact it will make. This is how it will make like you more successful and our team more successful. And so a lot of times, like, that's how I would navigate it is I would look for like bigger impact, bigger projects, more things I could take on. Um, and that would kind of be the initiation of the discussion. Um, and then timing, I think it's super critical to just, I mean, unless you're having performance issues, cause that could feel a little, uh, <laughs> you know, disconnected, but as long as you're performing well, I think sharing your intents and wants and you know, what you're thinking about and working towards constantly is really important because definitely what I see on the management side and the leadership side is like these conversations and opportunities can come up at any time and decisions can happen really quickly and you could not be part of those decisions. You know, they could just happen at an e-group meeting or like a, a, excuse me, people manager meeting. So I think just constantly sharing, you know, the intent of like, hey, I want to take on more. I want to do more. I want to lead this initiative. Um, and again, I would try to reframe away from, I want to be promoted and I would more reframe it as like, I want to take on this thing because I think it will make us very successful. I think it will make the company very successful. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my position about like how to talk to, talk to your manager about it and do it constantly, honestly. Like I would mm -hmm. say um, at least once a month, just bring up like, Hey, you know, I want to continue to grow in this way and I want to continue to do that. Well, it also showcases your curiosity of like, I'm noticing this need or I'm noticing that my skill set could fit well with this project. So that's good advice. Carolyn, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, certainly. And Ali, I, I echo so much of, of what you said. Um, we also have a similar saying at AlphaSense where it's, you know, the client first, company, team, self. And if you keep those things in mind, I think... Um, it can really help frame the way you're thinking about your business as well as where you fit inside of that business and how you can help contribute to the growth of that organization. Um, in terms of timing, I think it often it's the frequency, bringing it up as early as possible. And it goes two ways, right? I think if you're managing a team of people, it's important that they're talking to you about what their goals and desires are in the future, whether that's near term, maybe it's the next 12 months, maybe it's the next two years, but also understanding what each of those individuals longer term plans are. You know, do they have a desire eventually in their career in five years to become a CRO of an organization or the head of marketing, or they want to be a sales leader, understanding the big picture and almost working backward with how do we work on the skills necessary to get you there um, and understanding what their interests are so those can align with future opportunity that exists within the organization. But if you don't understand those things with the people that you're working alongside, it's hard to plan ahead and when an opportunity arises suddenly everybody's scrambling and they're like oh but I, i'd be interested in that role or i'd be interested in that promotion and it's like wow i was never aware that you were interested in that you know this other person has approached me they've been talking to me about this for the past 18 months and we've had these these conversations along the way and you feel a little bit more prepared that person has been working on some skills that they might need for that next role and we've been discussing some of the areas for improvement or areas they could work on. How is their networking? All of those types of skills. So timing I think is critical and it should be early and often in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. That's a great point too. I mean, how often do we say I'm not a mind reader? And from the manager perspective, if you're not bringing those things up, how are they to know that you are interested in those areas if conversations mm -hmm. are happening at a leadership level that you're not seeing, they can go ahead and, and start nudging you in that direction if they know you're interested. It's a really good kickoff for the conversation. Allie, 
you had an incredible seven year stint at Salesforce before joining GitLab. And in that time, you actually uncovered a business need kind of to what you were speaking to a second ago and carved out a new role that ended up becoming really instrumental to the business. Tell us more about how that came about and then how you conveyed your learnings in a way that was heard and then acted upon. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I joined Salesforce in the strategy group. I think if I recall correctly, it was a while ago, but I was leading our middle market strategy team. Um, and I would say every like, and this is kind of what I was talking about, you know, in terms of promotions happening more naturally. It was like every six months, um, I would take on like more parts of the business. Um, so I took on like our lat LATAM teams in addition to America. Then I took on the entire commercial business, so inclusive of SMB. Um, and then I took on some enterprise pieces. And so it got to the point where I was basically leading like our Amer strategy team. So it was a pretty big team. Um, and then I became really impassioned around our SMB business. For those of you who are familiar with Salesforce, it's very direct sales driven. You know, if we have a revenue target, we're going to invest likewise percentage in our go to market on the direct sales side to hit said revenue target. Um, but what I was really seeing was that the SMB business was changing and that buyers didn't always want to interact with direct sales. Um, we were struggling a little bit more in the SMB market. We were investing a ton in direct sales headcount. Customers and leads weren't as receptive. So we would have, you know, a fully staffed SDR, BDR, AE team, and they weren't getting people who wanted to talk or who were responding. And I had this belief, which I don't think is going to be, you know, mind blowing to anyone as a consumer that a lot of these buyers wanted to interact online or self-service. And it was an interesting one because this is an example of where like none of my bosses, um, so I, I worked most closely with like our CRO, CRO and then, or excuse me, our COO and then our head of sales and neither of was not a priority for either of them. It was not on their radar at all. They were not thinking about it. Um, so it was an example where I kind of had to pitch it and prove it out continually. And so it was very iterative. I think at that time I had a team of maybe 20 strategy folks. And so I funded one analyst to work on this um, and really like push product and engineering to start building out kind of simple things that customers could do on their own, set some targets around getting more stuff self-service and online. And we saw really big results really quickly. And so I got attention at the executive level from like cost cutting perspective, which is not exactly what I was going before, but I was like, I'll take it. I'll take any funding I can get. And then, um, so I can continue to get more funding. And then on the strategy side, again, I was still on the sales side. I had about a five person team at the end working on it solely. Um, and it continued to just post like incredible results in terms of transferring more business self-service, better responses from customers. And I think a recognition of like, oh, wow, we really could be doing things a lot different within SMB. And then the leadership asked me if I wanted to move to product and start a new team, almost like a business unit that we would just address the SMB business completely different. And that's what I ended up doing because I was really interested in it. I, uh, for those on the call, I don't know who have been on the strategy side of the house. It's a really interesting role. You learn so much, but I was kind of craving having more ownership and quota and kind of being in the game, not on the sidelines is the analogy that I'll use. So I moved into product to take on the SMB business um, and really build out our online sales at Salesforce. And it was a great experience. I learned a ton and I think a perfect example of, you know, I basically created the role that I, I went into and it was very small, very iterative, you know, for probably the first four months, it was like me doing a pet project on the side. Then I got one analyst and that was like maybe four months. And then, you know, and I joked that it was almost a startup within Salesforce because it felt like I had to, Salesforce is a big company. I had to do a lot of presentations and pitches for this business unit, for this funding. And so people would always joke that I was like going around looking for, you know, doing my funding pitch, presenting it 
<laughs> to executives. And um, but yeah, it was a great experience. I learned a ton, and that's ultimately why GitLab poached me because they wanted me to build the same same thing at GitLab. I think that's a great example too of even if it ends up being great you had to do so much to get buy-in and really show your work and test things out. And it wasn't an overnight thing. So I think that's a, a good example in resilience and also sticking with something to ultimately see the success that you had. That's great. Carolyn, you had a fun entry point to sales. You mentioned this a little bit in your intro where you are the end user of a product and then turned seller of said product. What was your thought process in making that career transition and how did your experience as a user influence the way you approach sales in general? Yeah, for sure. Um, I was super bored with what I was doing is basically the gist of it. Um, I was an equity analyst for a bank, as I mentioned earlier, and I was utilizing this now defunct product. It's, it's since been sunset, but it was like the it thing back in the day for analysts. It was um, a server-based model. Think of like a Bloomberg, if you guys are a little bit familiar with that. But I used to use this product every day and it was just so phenomenal. And I was one of the biggest champions and cheerleaders of this service. And the person who used to service our account, this rep would come into town and she would take us to dinner and she would bring us, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. And she'd talk about the new features of the product. And wow, I, I literally was like, if I could do any job on the planet, I would love to do this person's job. And because I had such a passion for the product, such a belief in what this thing did, I was like, I could, I could sell this. Like I want to do her job. And that's kind of, that was my foray or my entry into sales in that having a true passion for something is really the key to unlocking how to connect and communicate with your client. And if you have a strong belief in what you're delivering in terms of whether it's a physical something or it's a service, but you believe deeply in what you're what you're selling and what you're supporting, it it's it's a natural fit. Like it just feels so good to be helping other people in what they're doing and their workflow and improving their efficiency or whatever that may be. Um, but that was sort of my entry point into sales, just having this this passion and just desire to shout from the rooftops how great this particular product was. And ever since then, the various companies I've worked with and for since, I've always followed the product. So if I believe in the product and just think it's like the next big great thing, um, I can get behind it 100% and feel just very impassioned about having that conversation with clients and it comes through um, in those conversations and also with the reps that I'm supporting now in a sales management role, like this is, this product is so phenomenal. Like be really proud and confident going into these conversations with clients because you're delivering something that is unique. It's differentiated in the market and it's making a true impact on these organizations. Um, and I think that that's so critical with anything that you sell is having that true core belief that it is something that's game changing um, and it is a disruptor and it's a differentiator in the market. But that was sort of my experience and it's, and it's led to a lot of success in my career by following the product and having that true belief and core passion about what I am selling and supporting. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, product is important to sellers in general, but I don't know that it's always that top thing. Maybe they're looking for leadership or culture or more money or whatever the case may be. So for you, product being so critical, are you doing anything when you're evaluating new opportunities or in an interview process to take it a step further to really determine whether that is a product you're going to get behind and could have a passion for? Yeah, I mean, 100%. I think it's all of those things in totality, right? It's, it is about the leadership and the people, the 
the company, the culture that you're going to be a part of? Do they fit your ethos? Do they fit the sort of the, the foundation and the values that you hold? Um, are they like-minded people? Are they, do they have a growth mindset? Are you going to learn from them? Like there's so many, you know, great assets that you bring to an organization, but there's also so much more we can learn and you want to surround yourself with really smart people, people that you can learn from, like maybe even if it's just learning a different way of doing something. Um, but for me personally, it, it definitely has to be product led. I think that that's like, a, that's like a that's like a game changer for me in terms of making a decision in terms of the company I'm going to join. Um, when I was interviewing for AlphaSense, actually, the the hiring manager, we had gone really far down into the interview process. We were at the very end, and he's like, "So, what do you think? You know, are you are you ready to come on board and and become like?" you know, a, a true, you know, leader at AlphaSense. And I said, yeah, I'm just not sure yet. And he, he was stunned. He was like, I, I don't understand, like, why? And I said, you haven't shown me the product yet. And he was like, okay, okay. And I said, you know, I really have to believe deeply in what I'm selling and feel really confident. And so he, you know, opens his laptop and he's giving me a demo. And I literally had a visceral reaction. I literally had goosebumps when he showed me what this product could do and deliver to clients. And I was just over the moon. I was like, this is exactly what I was looking for, that type of reaction to what I know would be such a great fit in, in the market. So that's mm -hmm. what got me really excited. But you're right, uh, Katie, it's, it is all encompassing. You wanna look at multi-factor, but I think um, the foundation for me anyway, it needs to be like the, the belief in the product. Yeah, that makes I have sense. A quick, I have a quick anecdote that a sales or a leader that I work, worked for for a while told me that I've has stuck with me and I have found to like really work is he kind of oversimplified it. And he said, when you wake up in the morning, like if you're considering, you know, multiple opportunities, when you wake up in the morning, pretend you're doing the one and just see what your gut feeling is. And it's, it's actually been incredibly powerful for me. Like I've used it for a lot of internal transitions as well. So I just wake up in the morning, pretend I'm, you know, getting dressed and ready for this job and just feel how my gut feels. And yeah, it's really helped guided me. It's so simple, but it's really worked. I think that that speaks a lot to our intuition too, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, totally. And it true. takes some of that overthinking out of it. I can overthink something without actually doing the action. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of helps remove some of that overthinking. That's a good anecdote. Yeah. Okay. For both of you, Carolyn, we'll stick with you for this answer first. And then Allie would love your thoughts. So from a leadership lens, even when an employee is doing great work, promotions aren't always possible from that business point of view. So I'm curious, what are some of the factors that go into promoting someone and what advice do you have for those that are in a, we can't right now situation? Uh, yeah, I, I can actually speak from experience on that. I had um, I had a rep, I, I will say it was probably 11 months prior, you know, they were they were new in, in a role, but they were doing exceptionally well. Um, and they came to me well ahead of any time there was going to be an, an opportunity for a promotion, but express the interest. They were like, you know, I've been in this role for quite a while. I feel like I'm doing really well. This is my interest. I'm sort of interested in transitioning into this new position, different type of sale, different type of persona. But ultimately, that's what I think is my next stepping stone. And there wasn't an opening. But I said, that's great. It's, it's really good to know. I will tell you, there isn't an opportunity for that right now. But why don't we talk about like some of the things that you could be working on today to get comfortable and be ready for that role if and when it happens. And I think preparation is so critical. So we spent, you know, the course of the next three, six, nine months having that conversation, you know, regularly and talking about, okay, so what have you been working on that's related to that role? to help you be prepared if an opening were to, to come about um, at, at a particular time in the future. 
And I think it positioned this individual so well that it was, it literally made my job easier too, because when the time came for there to be an opening, there was a, there was a, a, you know, restructuring and a reorg within the organization and that exact role opened and he was there to raise his hand. I was well aware of his intention and his interest. And we had worked on some of the skills needed over the past, you know, three, six, nine months. And so the transition was almost seamless. It, it was a really simple um, maneuver to get this person into that new role. Um, and I felt like it was good for the business, as we've talked about, like, where is the need for the business? But it was also a great career transition and growth opportunity for this individual. And for me as a leader, it was a good learning experience for me as well, because it allowed me to understand what are some of the skills and helping to I, helping that individual identify some of those gaps and help them work on um, leveling up so that they were ready. So all around, I felt like it was an extremely good experience. Um, doesn't always work that way, but in this particular case, just by way of an example, that that was really helpful. Um, so I always tell anybody who comes to me interested in pursuing a new role or wanting growth in their career, it might not happen now, but let's prepare you for when that opportunity happens. And I'm sure, Ali, you can attest, you know, your company is, I know, is growing rapidly as well. So is AlphaSense and things happen. New opportunities are coming about all the time, like in a growth organization, such as the one that we're on, we're in, opportunities are abound and you don't know when they're going to happen. So it's best to prepare and be ready for when that opportunity does arise. And then you're ready to make that transition a little bit more easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really helpful perspective. Allie, anything to add? Um, I think Carolyn covered it great. I think the one thing I would be mindful of is that can be an excuse coming from a manager. So I would just make sure that you stress test that a little bit and just be sure that, you know, it's not just an easy way out. Because I think sometimes if a manager thinks you are not ready or they're not interested in promoting you, they can easily just use that as an excuse. So I think the strategy that Carolyn mentioned in terms of, you know, tackling any objections is really important to sussing that out, you know, like what, what is the role that I want? What is the skill set required? Documenting that with your manager, like how am I doing against all these skill sets? Do you agree? And also, you know, even asking them to network a little bit, you know, have you shared that you think I'm ready for this promotion? Just stress testing it a little bit to make sure that you're aligned and you both believe you're ready. And it's more just the, the business need that's lacking. Um, and then I think related to what I was talking about earlier, taking an iterative approach in all these examples is super helpful. You know, they might not have a role open right now, or they might not have the funding right now, but can you take three to four hours a week, if your manager's comfortable with it, to work on some of this stuff um, and just test test the waters, partner with that team. And I think that's so helpful. It helps you to, to know, do I actually want this job? Because you get some exposure. It helps to show them that you're ready. So if you start working with you know a potential team or an area that you're interested in, if you do a good job, then they're gonna get that funding and they're gonna create that role quicker. So I think that's a really good strategy too, if you feel like you're in the waiting or holding pattern. Mm -hmm. Along these lines, because we're talking about an employee having some of these conversations with their manager, even if the answer is not right now, in a brand new role, this may look different, but typically with you know standard sales roles or even other go-to-market roles, there are comp bands that you've got to stick within. So whether the employees know that or not, and then the manager shares it, your hands are tied in some aspects of what that comp range could look like. For a brand new role, Allie, in your case, when you kind of created this new role at Salesforce, were you approaching with compensation requirements or did they come to you with that? What did that process look like? And then how do you actually advocate for yourself in that title comp piece when there isn't something already there? Yeah. 
it's I'm gonna admit I find all these com- conversations very uncomfortable so I do have to push myself just to acknowledge that that it is uncomfortable and I think I've been in both situations I've been in situations where I feel like my manager is very much advocating for me pushing constantly getting as much as they can possibly get for me and so I feel confident and I can kind of sit back and know that it's taken care of and I've been in other situations where I know my manager you know, cares about me, thinks I'm top talent, but they're not fighting for those areas. So then I need to kind of step up and advocate more for myself. And really what I do is I go back to that framework of uh, ship, shipmates, self. And when I talk about it, I talk about, hey, here's the impact that I'm driving. Here's what I'm owning. These are all the things that I'm doing. And I try to have some benchmarks, whether it's internal. So GitLab, it's pretty crazy crazy, but we have a comp calculator that is in our handbook. So every single employee can look at it. So you can easily see what other people, it's for transparency and equity across the company. So it's really easy to benchmark. Um, and again, in those conversations, I drive, hey, this is what I'm owning. This is the impact I want to make. This is what seems fair based on like the impact and the, and the you know, what I've delivered to the company. And so that's kind of how I how I approach it. I try to have very factual, objective, focused on the impact and the ownership that I'm taking at the company and then having some benchmarks in place. But it is awkward, I will say. It's uncomfortable. So it's like every time I have those conversations, I I have to kind of <laughs> prep myself. I have to probably do some imaginary conversations before I get on the call. Um, but they have all been been received well. And I think, again, when you focus on how you're driving impact for the company and that's your focus and you want to be successful in making the company successful and you want to be compensated accordingly. I think that's a good way to go. I think whenever I have employees who come to me and it feels like, and this happens all the time, you would think this wouldn't happen, but it happens all the time. Employees come to me and they're like, I want a promotion. I want a raise. That is a little hard to take you know it's like okay but for what reason what why do you deserve this what's going on and so again I think anytime you have these conversations focus on how you're making your manager successful how you're making the company successful what you're owning how you're excited about driving impact for the company and like focus on that and then how your comp should match what you're driving is my advice there Mm-hmm. I agree with you more on that, Allie. I think that's that's pretty spot on. It's like, it's like, what are you going to do for us, and right. and what is the value tied to that? You know, and it has the ROI has to be there, and if it's not yet proven, I think you at least have to build the business case, even if you have to pull. I'm I'm curious to know if you've ever had to pull like external, um, you know, data or if you've gone outside the organization to pull some some supporting information for that particular, especially if it's a new role like you were describing. I, the only thing I've done is um, I've responded to recruiters and I've gotten comp ranges that they're offering. So mm-hmm. that's kind of, and it's more happened naturally. Like if a role comes up and I'm being recruited, I'll ask for the comp range and then I get really good benchmarks quickly in terms of, you know, and I think in in a lot of the postings on LinkedIn now you can see comparable roles at comparable companies and what the salary range is. And I think, yes, absolutely. I think that should be part of the benchmarking. And I, I think you have to do it in a really respectful way because you have to know that this conversation can make the other person be defensive you know, you're coming into this meeting, you're telling me that you want more comp, you're telling me that you're looking around at other companies and it can be a very hard thing to hear as a manager. So just keep that in mind and really try to position it as respectfully as possible. You know, I really, just to role play a little bit, like I really love this job here. I love what I'm doing. I want to drive the, you know, the impact that I'm driving, but I just want to make sure that I'm compensated fairly. And based on what I'm seeing, I believe you know, that this would be fair. What do you think? And how do we get there? Is like what I would suggest. But just know that it is a hard conversation and it's, it'll probably be a bit surprising for your manager to hear like, hey, you're not happy with your comp. Hey, you're looking around and comparing yourself to others within the company and ex- 
outside of the company. Mm -hmm. How should managers think about you know, whether it's an, it, whether the employee handles it great, like you just gave an example of, or maybe not as great. How do they think about um, making sure they're making their employees feel heard and advocated for, even if it is not a possibility for a promotion, or even if it is encouraging them to seek elsewhere? I know, Allie, when we talked individually, you even talked about that. You want the best for your reps, even if that means they're not at the company at mm -hmm. anymore. So what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. Um, I would say I take a bit of a different approach. I've had like several employees kind of be surprised on my, res my responses in situations like this. I'm pretty pragmatic and I also try to not take things personal or situations personal. So if someone comes to me and, you know, they want a promotion right now or they want to raise right now and I know that it's not possible and it's not going to happen, I will tell them that. And I will have a very pragmatic conversation like, hey, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to get that for you. It could be six or eight months till we get there. Are you comfortable waiting or do you want to look, you know, elsewhere? And I almost encourage it because I think in my experience where someone is restless or someone has made up their mind, if we go above and beyond to try to keep them, it's very rarely a good situation. You know, they end up staying for two to three months and then they leave. And like during those two to three months, they're not super motivated or invested. So I think for me, you know, I, I think it's just to try to shake off all the scary things of maybe switching company or having these conversations and just have like very realistic, you know, what is most important to you? What do you want right now? Are you going to be able to get it at this company? If not, you know, like where should we be looking or what is the actual solution and how can I help you? So yeah, I've had a lot of employees that are like, what? You know, like you're ready, you're you're help you're gonna help me look for something else or you're and it's not coming from a place of like, I don't think you're a good employee and I don't want to keep you. It's more just I know everyone has their own personal needs or what's most important to them. And you know, like maybe it's not this company and let's figure it out faster. I think that's better for everyone involved. Mm-hmm. That ties into this next question around how you personally evaluate new opportunities for yourself. Um, you mentioned what's most important to you, opportunity matrix. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I do. Um, it's it's trying to be slightly quantitative what I do. Um, and I've had a few people copy it, but it's a little weird. So I when I'm considering opportunities, I first take a step back and I reflect at this time in my life, what is most important to me? And it has definitely changed. Like if you looked at little Allie getting out of college, I was like, how much money am I making? That's the most important thing. That was like very top of my matrix. Then I would say like, as I spent, you know, maybe five to seven years in the professional world, that dropped a little bit and it was more, what am I working on? And what is most exciting for me? Where am I learning? Who am I working for? Boss started jumping up too as I learned how important your boss can be. <laughs> Excuse me. And then I think having now a three-year-old and a one-year-old and a pony, as Melissa said, um, <laughs> work-life balance has jumped up a little bit more. You know, first when I graduated college, work-life balance, I didn't care at all. I was like, I'm ready to grind. Let's go. So I think it's really you know, where you are in life and what's most important to you. So what I do is I kind of stack rank all those things. So I stack rank boss, I stack rank work-life balance, I stack rank compensation, I stack rank, you know, just all the things that are most important. And it's highly personal. So you can like start with some of mine, but I would also add like, you know, really reflect like what makes me happy, what fulfills me. Um, and then I actually do like Harvey balls for each category by the different things I'm considering. And for those of you that know, Harvey balls are basically just a pie and it's saying like, how, how great is this role for the boss? You know, is the boss someone that I'm excited to work for, that I respect, that I look up to, that has a good working style. And I go through each one and it's a way to give you some clarity on different things you're, you're considering. And it's been it's been super helpful for me. And it's funny when we were prepping for this, I was sharing that a lot of times in my position, people come to me and they're like, Hey, I'm considering this and this, what should I do? And they want me to tell them what to do. And I never do because I think that 
again, it's highly personal and you really need to reflect. Like I can guide you and help you kind of consider what are the different things between the role, but ultimately this all has to be your decision. And if you follow, you know, what other people tell you to do or think is the best option, that could make them happy or fulfilled, but that's not you. And so I think really taking a step back and reflecting, and I learned that I think midway through my career, because again, I graduated college and I was a little bit in the race and I was like, Ooh, I want to be promoted as quickly as possible. And that's going to fulfill me. And then, you know, very quickly, I got to like director, senior director at Salesforce. And I was like, Oh, this, and this is personal. That could fulfill some people. But for me, I was like, this actually isn't fulfilling at all. Just having this title change, you know? Um, So I think, yeah, just reflecting on like what, makes you happy, what's important to you, and how how well the things you're considering hit on those areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great perspective. Carolyn, what do you find yourself coaching on most often as it relates to managing up and advocating for yourself from a coaching point of view to your reports? Yeah, I think, um, and I, Allie, I, everything that you said resonated so strongly with me. Um, just to follow on all those points, I think you have to figure out like what season you're in, in your own life. And I think um, all too often, I've seen a lot of folks within an organization feel compelled to ask or want a promotion because that's what's going on around them with their peer group. And instead of looking at it in isolation, in terms of what is it that I need at this time for me, they're just they're kind of following the herd, like, oh, all these people are getting promoted around me. And I feel like that's what I, that, that feels like the next thing that I, that I should be doing. Um, So anyway, that really just resonated with me. I just want to comment on that. But I think, um, you know, in terms of like, how do I, how do I coach um, or what is the, the thing that I'm coaching most often in terms of helping individual contributors manage up or, you know, Um, I'll use an example of like our SDRs, our sales development reps in our organization. We promote from within very heavily from that group of individuals. They're very young. They are fresh out of college. Most often it's, it's generally their first job out of school and they are just not sure of what to do. And I've had many of them come to me, you know, asking for advice, like, what do I do? How, how do I navigate or advocate for myself? How do I, how do I best prepare to put myself in a position to be promoted? What do I do? And my suggestion is, well, you've taken the first step in doing that. You've reached out to somebody who's in a leadership position and you're asking, like, that's the most important step in my opinion is proactively pursuing somebody who may have the answer for you, who might have the knowledge and the path forward um, and, and encouraging them, do that with other leaders. Don't just do it with your immediate leader, but go outside of your realm and speak with, maybe it's another vertical leader, maybe it's another business head within the organization and get different perspectives. Like understand what it is that they're looking for in your current role that you can work on so that you can put your best foot forward and elevate yourself in that role so that when the time comes, that manager or that hiring manager is thinking, wow, that person's really impressed me. They've reached out to me. They've advocated for themselves. They're asking what they should do. They're asking what very next steps may look like um, and how else they can best position themselves for the next role, even if it's in nine months, even if it's in a year, but they're doing it early enough that they have that runway to, to prepare. But it's, it's more, um, it's more than just, um, getting ready from an experience perspective. It's, it's networking, helping yourself be known your brand within the organization, building your brand early and often and letting those people who are going to be the future leaders of the company or existing hiring managers, they need to know who you are. They need to put a name 
to your face. They need to understand like, who is this person? How are they different? How are they differentiated from their peers? What's making them unique or special? What skills do they have? And so that's self-advocating. It's letting people know who you are and what skills you have that you can contribute to the company in that next role. Um, that's probably the number one thing that I recommend or, or um, share with some people who are asking me for that advice. Um, Cause not everybody will just know your name on a spreadsheet. You have to, you have to mm-hmm. shake hands and you have to ask for people's time. And I think sometimes that's challenging because they think like, Ooh, this is, this is a big manager. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm nervous to ask for time with them, but everybody has 15 minutes. Everybody has 15 minutes to spend with someone. Um, so that, that's just my biggest piece of advice with, with self-advocating and, and, um, getting those people to level up into the next tool. I, yeah, I love that idea of, you know, setting up time and getting some feedback across the organization. And I think in those meetings, like I would be very direct, like, Hey, I am interested in this based on what you've seen, you know, like, what am I lacking? Where should I focus? Because to our earlier point, like you want to be in a position where now all these people might be in a meeting that you're not in and they all know that you're interested in this. They've given you feedback on if you, if they think you're qualified or not, you've worked on that feedback. So I think using those 15 minutes to be very direct and getting great feedback and, you know, getting advocates, you can even be direct as like, Hey, if I went up for this, would you support me? If so, you know, like if not, why, um, I think, yeah, I think that's a great idea to really solicit um, feedback and support from different organizations. Mm-hmm. 100%. I've even encouraged, um, I've even encouraged people to throw their hat in the ring, even if I know they might not quite be ready, because there's a lot of learning in that. Going through the activity or the exercise of preparing for the interview, going through the interview, getting the feedback from the interview. They may not quite be there in terms of being fully ready for the role, but going through that exercise, um, I think there can be tremendous growth for someone and a lot of learnings along the way. Um, mm-hmm. So even if it's a no, not now, there there's a lot that they can take away from that experience and that, that, that activity that can help them get there in the, in the next round or the next opportunity. Yeah. All great points. And you mentioned Carolyn, the personal brand piece. We did a session earlier this year that y'all can find on our website and YouTube page that is all about building your personal brand. So if you want more context there, audience, definitely check that out. We have one more question. We addressed the question that was dropped in here. If there are any others, now's the time. We're approaching the end here. My last question to both of you, um, and Allie, we can start with you. What advice do you have for individual contributors interested in transitioning to management, given that that can usually be part of this career pathing conversation? Yeah, I think we've touched on a lot of themes related to this. So I think intent is very important in sharing your intent, you know, having these one-on-ones, having these conversations. Hey, I'm really interested in people management. That's something I want to pursue. Let me know if you see opportunities within the organization for me to do that. I also think taking the iterative approach is really valuable. And that's a little more challenging with people management, but you can get creative. You can try to be a mentee for someone new. You can be an onboarding buddy. You know, you can take on these positions where you're having someone who's coming to you for support and advice. I also think taking on an intern is a great one. And a lot of companies, you know, will do that for the summer and it's very, very cheap and easy to do. Um, You can even take on college kids. There's a lot of different colleges that are, are reaching out to corporate sponsors asking if they can do projects. So you can manage those college kids with their project for your company. So I think finding opportunities where you can start to trust, st- stress test that muscle and then also just sharing with everyone that you're interested in that and looking for opportunities for it. Mm-hmm. Let me think yeah. Carolyn. Yeah, for sure. I think with with us individual contributor, it's, it's a little more challenging to 
suddenly transition from being an individual seller into suddenly managing a handful of sellers. And what we have found that works really well is having someone lead a pod. So they're actually doing the player coach role. And I, I have an individual who reports up to me for the past two years, he's been in that player coach role. And it's, it's probably one of the harder roles to do um, because you still have your hand in contributing revenue to your organization, but you're also in a leadership position where you're helping mentor and coach other sellers because we want to replicate, you know, what they're doing so well. We want them to coach and lead um, by example of what they're doing and replicating that success. Um, but I think it's a really excellent way for them to understand I'm doing this part time. Do I like it? more than what I was doing before being an individual contributor? And am I ready to make that full transition into being a leader without having my hand in all of the individual sales and things like that? And for a person who has a passion for selling, that can be a really hard transition going from, you know, always having your hand in the client conversation and signing and dealing, you know, negotiating contracts. That's that's a big reason why people go into sales. They have that, just that pure desire and, and interest in, you know, communicating with your clients and so on. Um, but getting a taste for nurturing those sellers and sharing your expertise and helping them develop into exceptional sellers, that can also be rewarding. But I think you have to um, straddle that for a period of time to determine, is that the route I really want to take or do I want to, to stay in, you know, individual contributorship? Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I've seen it go both ways. Um, the individual I was just referring to, they are moving into management. They've decided that that's something they're really interested and passionate about. I've also had an individual in the past that's been in that split role and they've decided that is not for me. I do not like the ins and outs and all the headaches that comes with managing a team of people. It's too much admin work. I'm going to stay, you know, on the sales side and there's nothing wrong with that. It's you've tested the waters and, and decided that's not for you. But I think that that's a great way to help somebody transition into that role is to um, maybe do a hybrid for a period of time similar to what you were referring to, Allie, like a mentorship and, and things like that, that, that's in addition to your current role. I think that that's really important to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had several leaders share a similar sentiment where management isn't for everyone and that's okay. You can be a mm -hmm. leader no matter what role you're in. So really good takeaways all around. I don't see any other questions in here. So we'll go ahead and wrap for the day. Thank you both for sharing. Thanks for hanging in there, Allie. I hope you're able to rest the rest of the day and um, good health to everyone on the call as well as we go into the holiday season. Um, just a reminder, both GitLab and AlphaSense are hiring and you can check out those open roles on our website. We'll also include those links in a follow-up email tomorrow. And we have one more event to close out the year week after next on ending the year well, resetting for a new year and all the things that go into that. So definitely check out that event. Otherwise, I will leave everyone to their day and thanks for attending. Have a good one, everyone. Thank thanks, you. everyone.